Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Starbase Flyover Update Episode 8. My name is Mauricio and today I'll be taking you on a tour of Starbase, starting off at Massey's test site, Sanchez, build site, and the launch site. I can't really see much from down here, so let me take you up to 10,500 feet and let's take a better look. Consider supporting us on Patreon to gain early access to all the flyover images the same day they are taken. And the support helps out tremendously with paying for the expenses associated with the flyover for the 172 that we use. Thank you so much and enjoy the video. First and foremost, we'll start this week's episode at the Massey's test site, previously known as the Massey's gun shop and range before SpaceX bought it in 2021. Here's a map layout of the locations of the pads. Comparing the first flyover taken on July 5th. Now sliding over to a second photo of Massey's taken on July 14th with quite a few notable changes. As always, feel free to scrub back and forth the video to see more of the differences between these photos. Firstly, we take a look at the Booster Cryogenic Testing Station, which has finally been completed and prepared for booster testing. Indeed, we saw Booster 10 rolled out from the Rocket Garden at Sanchez bound for Massey's test site on the evening of July 7th and into the early morning of July 8th. This is the first time we've ever seen a booster travel south along Highway 4 bound for the Massey's test site. Thanks to our friends at Lab Padre for providing this footage. As to what we expect this booster to do at Massey's, we see that it has already been connected to the GSC coming from the tank farm via the booster quick disconnect seen here. This means that we can expect the booster to undergo cryoproof testing, which involves the booster being loaded with cryogenic liquid nitrogen while under pressure. We can expect this in the next week or so. It sure seems like SpaceX is aiming to get a head start on testing the booster which we expect to be used for the IFT-3 mission. Another test that future boosters will likely undergo is puck shucking testing, once the booster puck shucker seen here is moved into position at the crowd testing station. It's worth mentioning that since this puck shucker has not yet had its thrust ramps installed and moved into place, it may be a while before we see booster 10's puck being shucked, if at all seeing as Booster 10's thrust puck design has already been structurally verified. This week, we noticed these 12 square tubular pieces have been staged near and around the booster puck shucker. They will likely be installed on top of the curved steel pieces that wrap around the whole puck shucker base, and will likely become part of the structure that the boosters will actually sit on during testing. Once again moving down, we see the ship puck shucker, where we notice the small gray pistons have been installed near the main thrust ram pistons responsible for pushing on the engine mount of the ships. This is quite a strange move, as previous puck shucking tests did not involve the use of smaller pistons like this. We speculate that they could be used to help stabilize the structure and keep everything in place while the thrust ramps push up against the bottoms of the ship, although this remains only a theory for now. Looking further down and to the right, we spot 12 more curved pieces of steel, just like the ones that wrap around the full circumference of the booster puck shucker base. What could these be used for? Leave your speculation in the comments below. Moving down, we see the staging area that previously hosted the remains of nose cone 31 has been cleared. This is likely in preparation for a new workshop building due to be built here soon. We know this because of a public document released recently that talks about a new workshop building due to be constructed at Massey's. Moving upwards and to the right, we see the former structural testing cage formerly used for testing the previously mentioned nose cone 31, being reconfigured likely for testing the S24.2 payload bay test article currently located in the ring yard. This half of the cage has now been placed onto the structural test cage stand where we can expect it to be used in the following weeks. If you'd like a more detailed explanation about what to expect with S24.2 testing, be sure to check out this Twitter thread from the ring watchers on Twitter. Interestingly, this half of the cage has already been placed on top of the stand, which is different from the usual procedure of placing the test article on the stand first and then lowering the cage over the top of that. It's possible this is just a test fit of the reconfigured cage before it's lifted off the stand again to make way for S24.2 to be placed on the stand and subsequently lifting of the cage over this test article and onto the stand again. On top of the can crusher, we saw the removal of some of the outer walkway sections as well as pistons from this side of the testing station. We also see this horizontal bar stretching across. Initially it was thought to be a testing device, but now the top candidate for this comes from Jax, where he found that the removal of the walkways as well as the hydraulic pistons both point to the can crusher's decommissioning. 
The horizontal bar acts as a structural beam to provide extra support as the can crusher is being dismantled. Stay tuned for next week's video to see further confirmation of this. Now moving further left to the horizontal liquid nitrogen storage tanks. Even more pipework was connected to these tanks as SpaceX prepares to expand the liquid nitrogen capacity of the tank farm which in turn will help a lot with cryogenically testing boosters. Ending our tour Massey's, we come full circle all the way to the top of Massey's where we notice the 9 hydraulic pistons that were uninstalled recently from the can crusher still sitting in front of this tent. Next up, we fly along Highway 4 to the Sanchez site where the writers have finally managed to run out of fun historical facts to tell you about this site. Here is a photo of the Sanchez site taken on Wednesday, July 5th. And here's a second photo taken on Wednesday, July 14th. As always, if you like more comparison time on these photos, feel free to scrub back and forth to see more of the differences. Starting off at the leftmost tip of Sanchez, where the Grand Fabrication Building has found a new home. This week, we notice that the framework for the main section of this building has started being erected and we also see the bridge crane for this building placed on the framework as well. Also worth mentioning is we know now the entrance to the building will be oriented towards Highway 4, giving us a good chance of being able to see inside of the ground fabrication building. Moving over to the right, we see this vertical storage tank has been delivered and staged here recently, and it's now being wrapped in insulation. Also noteworthy that a new concrete pad has appeared at the back of the launch site, which we'll be covering that shortly. Looking up, we take a look at where the small steel plate manifold assembly was located the past couple of months. It's finally gone now, and in its place sits a new ring structure made of horizontal curved steel pieces and a white vertical box pieces, now being assembled. We haven't seen a ring structure quite like this one before, but we'll make sure to update you on its purpose as we find out more about this. And as usual, we'll take a look at the assembly area for the pre-built Mega Bay 2 sections, located at the center of Sanchez. Here we see one fully assembled corner section. This is the final corner section of level 4 of the Mega Bay 2. And we also see another corner section in the early stages of assembly nearby. That is going to be the first corner section of level 5. Stacking of this bay is getting fairly close to the end now, with there being just two more levels to go after level 5. Real quick, we'll switch over to this angled view, where we find that the exit of the inventory tent has mostly been covered up again, following its wall being removed two weeks ago to allow for the centerpiece steel plate to exit this building and head to the launch site. Next up, we move up to take a look at the former scrapyard area, which was cleared ahead of making way for whatever is due to move into this area next. This week, we saw a concrete pile cap poured over the square pilings located in this area, laying the base for whichever building will be constructed here, though we're not certain what that will be. What we do know is that the concrete pad won't be used as a booster or ship holding pad, indicated by the lack of embeds. In our last stop at Sanchez, we'll take a look at the rocket garden. Here's a labeled image of the rocket garden. Notice this gap between booster 11 and 4. Switching back to the aerial view, we see this now vacant booster holding pad at the rocket garden where booster 10 once stood before it's moved to Massey's. It remains to be seen which booster gets to be moved here next. It's worth mentioning that the SPMTs or self-propelled modular transporters were moved to the ring yard in the early morning of Saturday the 15th. Which booster is next to be moved to the rocket garden? Let us know what you think. Banking right to the build site. Here's a labeled image showing what is planned to be the first rocket factory capable of mass production of starships. Here we have a shot comparing the first flyover of the build site from July 5th. Now sliding over to show another few seconds of the photo from July 14th to compare the changes. Firstly, let's take a look at the area to the left of Mega Bay 2, where we see the new location of the scrapyard after it was displaced by a new project starting in that area it used to be in at Sanchez. Moving on to the actual Mega Bay itself, which has seen an extremely rapid pace of construction this past month. This week, the second and third sections of Level 4 were transported from Sanchez to Mega Bay 2 and subsequently lifted into position. The jigs used to transport these two sections can be seen here and here. This recent progress leaves Mega Bay 2 just one section away from having its fourth level completed with the only remaining corner section for this level almost complete at Sanchez as mentioned earlier. Thanks to Lolomatic 3D from Twitter for allowing us to use this render showing the extent of Mega Bay 2 construction as of the writing of this video. 
Over here, we see a newly delivered shipped aft flap, one of the first to be delivered in quite a while. This will be used on ship 29, along with another aft flap still due to be delivered. Now moving to this older sibling, Mega Bay 1. But before we take a look inside, we notice that the area behind the bay has now been turned into a parking lot, as predicted by us in the previous episode. Weirdly, it seems like the rest of that bit of land behind Mega Bay 1 is being kept as an area covered in fake grass. You'd think all that area would be turned into a parking lot, but that doesn't seem to be the case right now. Now taking a peek inside Mega Bay 1 itself, where we see Booster 12 still sitting in two halves on the left hand side of the bay. This week, we also saw grid fins starting to be installed on the methane tank of the Booster 12, which we can expect to be stacked atop the LOX tank shortly, finally completing stacking of this booster. Moving to the right hand side of Mega Bay 1, we see Booster 9 still being worked on. As seen in this ground photo I took on Wednesday, we've also seen two new long steel tanks installed on the outside of the booster where the small chines used to be installed. Chines are now the same size as the other two chines that house the COPVs, are being installed over these new steel tanks. Now switching to the aerial view, we see these two remaining grid fins still waiting to be installed on booster 12 sitting outside this bay. Sliding over to the left, let's take a look at the high bay used by SpaceX to construct ships. Now switching to the ground angle, ship 28 and 29 are still sitting on the right side of the bay. We can also see the recently reinstalled payload bay door sealing the opening of ship 28's payload bay again. Here in this aerial view, we can see this undeveloped ship thrust sleeve with the stringered single ring placed on top of it sitting closer to the left side of the high bay. This is a setup that was being used to raise the single ring high above the ground to be able to weld it to the underside of S24.2 due to there being no robotic welding machine located at the ground level. This essentially means that the four ring undeveloped ship thrust sleeve isn't going to be part of S24.2 and was only acting essentially as a stilt for the single ring, which is due to be part of the payload bay test article. Now moving past the mid bay, home to S22 nose cone and e-dome assembly where we've seen no notable changes. Now moving to the ring yard, located in front of the mid bay. First, we see S24.2 sitting out in the ring yard after an aborted stacking attempt of this article onto the single ring stack welded on top of an undeveloped ship thrust sleeve inside the high bay. We hope to see another attempt at this stacking soon, which will hopefully end with a success this time as S24.2 is something that needs to be fully tested sooner rather than later. To the right of that, we also see Ship 30's midlock section sitting out in the ring yard, still waiting on Ship 30 stacking to commence in the high bay. This likely won't start until construction of the payload bay test article has been completed. We now slide over to the right and take a look at phase 2 expansion of the Star Factory. Starting at the right of the image, we see that roof paneling is now starting to be installed over the framework we saw erected over the past couple of months or so. On the right, we see the press pit, intended to be used for an industrial press machine which is still due to be delivered to Starbase. As indicated by the roofing framework now installed directly above it, we now know that the press machine will be rolled into place over the pit under the fully assembled factory roof, rather than being lifted into place above the press pit by a crane before the roof has been completed. Moving down, we see that the another section of the concrete flooring has been poured for this phase of the Star Factory expansion. Looking further down and to the right, we notice that more footings have been poured in the line, just above the plot of land that SpaceX currently does not own. This is a solid indication that the fire break wall seen here will not be extending all the way to the edge of the future Star Factory. Sliding down once more, we notice that even more footings for the factory foundation have been poured near the highway 4 end of the factory. Interestingly, we see groups of three footings situated down this end which would point towards more reinforcement being needed for this end of the factory due to it likely being a lot taller. And finishing up our tour of the build site, we look to the right at the former location of the ground fabrication building, which has mostly been emptied of hardware. The majority of steel and other materials have now moved to Sanchez. Next up is the launch site, where we've seen a torrent of changes this past week as the steel plate installation progresses. Here's a few seconds of the shot comparing the first fly over the launch site from July 5th. Here are another few seconds of the photo from July 14th to compare the changes. We'll start off our tour of the launch site by looking to the suborbital launch site. Looking past suborbital pad A, where nothing noticeable has occurred this past week. 
we see the LR11000 crane connected to Ship 25 still sitting atop Pad B. This is merely precaution to allow for additional safety for workers working in the tanks of the ship in order to maintain stability when the ship is not pressurized. Now looking under the actual ship itself as seen in this tweet unexpectedly shared by Elon Musk showing the inside of the engine bay of Ship 25. This picture shows that the engine shielding for all three sea level and three vacuum raptors have been entirely removed and Elon also hinted that the plan to increase the total number of Raptor vacuum engines on future ships to six was still on the table. Moving to the right, we see the middle of the launch site, at the area where future horizontal cryogenic storage tanks are due to be installed. We see the pedestal starting to be formed on the foundation closest to Highway 4 for the future storage tanks to sit on. Jake from the production team has come to a conclusion that it looks like a total of 10 pedestals will be formed in each of these two trenches. This means we can expect at least 10 horizontal storage tanks to eventually be installed here. Looking slightly downwards to the trench, the pilings here are also being exposed again, ahead of the second piling cap and pedestals being formed. Now moving to the back of the launch site, close to the water supply tanks which are responsible for supplying water to the water-cooled steel plates. Over here, we see that a small vertical tank was installed behind the two large water supply tanks this past week although it's unclear what this will actually be used for until they've fully plumbed it in. Switching over to another angle of the water supply tanks, we see that the new concrete pedestals are being formed behind the two high-pressure gas cylinder stacks. It's likely that these gas cylinders staged nearby are to be stacked on these new pedestals and be connected with Piper connecting it into the water-cooled steel plate system. Slightly to the left of the concrete pedestal sits this newly poured triangular-shaped concrete pad mentioned earlier in the Sanchez section of the video. This very well may be the pad that the newly delivered vertical storage tank currently at Sanchez might eventually sit on. Moving further up the image now, we see that the cradles for a third large water supply tank has been installed on top of the concrete pedestals. These cradles will be responsible for holding the cylindrical water supply tanks in place, and their arrival could be a promising sign that a third tank might be arriving shortly, expanding the water holding capacity. The cradles can be seen here in this render courtesy of Chrome Kiwi. Also visible here is the newly installed vertical tank sitting behind the two large water supply tanks, as well as the pipe work running from the water-cooled steel plate assembly, which we will now talk about. Rotating around the launch tower, we now see the orbital launch mount and stage zero in all its glory. Following steel plate installation, water manifold and pipe work installation, as well as concrete pouring that occurred since the last flyover. We'll start off by looking at the newly poured concrete on the side of the OLM but we're able to see rebar jutting out of the base layer in the preparation for pouring a ring of fondag on top of it. Concrete pouring has occurred throughout this past week, and this layer of concrete will eventually stretch all the way around the OLM, including this area where we see partially exposed pipework. This concrete layer being poured around the OLM is likely to be the last layer. All the pipework to feed water to the three steel plate manifolds have been installed. Fully welded and the pipework for the small and the large steel plate manifolds have mostly been covered in dirt. The pipework for the medium steel plate manifold has been completely covered in dirt. Once again, here's a render from Chrome Kiwi showing the medium manifold pipework that's now been covered, circled here. We now zoom in to the ground directly under the OLM where we see the steel plate assembly consisting of the hexagonal centerpiece Three plates with manifolds and three without manifolds have been installed within the span of less than two weeks, thereby completing steel plate installation. Although it's worth mentioning that the holes in the steel plates and other systems have yet to be added. The final white pipe connecting to the manifold was lifted and installed on the evening of July 8th, followed very quickly by all the other water supply pipes just three days after the first hexagonal plate was put in place. The water supply tanks that supplied the water for the system had a load of high-pressure gas expelled on tops of them four days later on July 12. This is likely part of the purging of the system. This is a truly remarkable rate of construction and as SpaceX proceeds with the rapid retrofit of Stage 0, make sure you're subscribed to our channel for more in-depth updates like this one. As of July 17th, we actually saw the first proper test of the system where we saw water expelled from the center plate at about only one-third power. Next up, we expect to see a full power test through the entire plate system. Massive thanks to Epic Spaceflight for allowing us to use the footage of this test from Hoopcamp. Now moving up the OLM to the launch ring, 
which holds the booster in place during testing and preparation for launch and is responsible for fueling it and the Raptors before launch. Here we see the rigging is currently being set up to test and verify all the booster hold down clamps again after they were reinstalled recently, following refurbishment. As expected, the Raptor QDs were indeed tested on the night of July 15th. We also know that the booster quick disconnect conducted a full speed retraction test followed by a second shortly after, on Thursday the 13th of July. Now climbing up the orbital launch tower, we see that new framework was installed on the platform still connected to the end of the ship QD arm indicating this platform will be staying. Better seen from this angle, it looks as if the ship QD unit will be able to rest on top of this new framework when the QD unit is fully extended. The height increase is a result of hot staging being used starting with the next launch of Starship onwards, as addition of hot staging rings would increase the height that the upper stage of Starship sits at, therefore prompting an increase in height of the ship QD. On our last stop at the launch site, we look to the bottom right of this image, to where the engine chill basin has now been relocated. As indicated by digging seen in this area in the past week, this may also take on the role of being a drainage pump for water during launches. Thank you for choosing to fly with RGV Aerial Photography. If you like what you saw today, please subscribe so you don't miss out on the new videos each week, and also leave a thumbs up. Also, please consider supporting our flyovers through Patreon to gain access to our flyover gallery the same day it occurs. All support helps to keep us flying each and every week. This is Mauricio and that's all for now.